All right. Um, thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure to be in Lubbock. This is my, my third visit over the past, uh, I don't know, three years. But uh, when I woke up this morning, it was, it was 37 degrees. So it reminded me of uh, Maine, where I'm from originally. And, um, and the, the, yeah, it was just uh, very cold. <laughs> so. So to talk a little bit about Wrangler, uh, Wrangler was born in 1947, uh, part of a little bit of our history. Um, we, were, uh, we were birthed by a brand called Bluebell, Bluebell Overalls. If you remember the Bluebell uh, label, it was, uh, um, it was actually given its name. Originally, it was, it was founded by a gentleman named C.C. Hudson in Greensboro, downtown Greensboro. And he, uh, he had his manufacturing shop not far from the rail yard where the, the train conductors and engineers used to come uh, on their breaks and come into the, the manufacturing floor. I, I'm imagining they had a shop in front where they could purchase the wares. And uh, the train engineers would uh, come in, buy the, the overalls and wear them. And at one point, they developed such a rapport with, with Mr. Hudson. Hudson here in, in, down, in downtown Greensboro that um, they gifted him a bell, this big bell from, from, the, uh, from the engine of the, of the train. And he was, uh, he was very thankful and enamored by this, this relationship with the, with the trains. He hung the, blue, the bell actually up on the, the center of the manufacturing floor. And uh, like many manufacturing, textile manufacturing environments uh, at the time, that bell gathered a certain amount of dust to it. Uh, the blue dust from denim processing, and he renamed the company Bluebell. And it's interesting optics because you know at the time um, that was uh, that was uh, this, this sort of romantic vision of renaming his company around Bluebell. Today, if we were to think about the optics around having dust particulate in a manufacturing environment, that's a human health concern, right? That's a that's something that's very uh, well, it's a big no-no in manufacturing today uh, around the world, and so um, it's it's just fascinating how things change. 1947, uh, Wrangler or Bluebell created Wrangler uh, as a, as the rodeo gene of choice, switching the the seams uh, on traditional denim, so it was a superior um, pair of denim for being in saddle, and you wouldn't incur that same sort of chafing. Uh, and today we, we are in a wide variety of outlets under a bunch of different Wrangler names or brands, sub-brands you might find um, scattered throughout the market. When we think broadly about sustainability, um, there is a, there's an organization called the Sustainability Consortium. It's, a, it's an organization of, of uh, companies, of academia, of nonprofit stakeholders, they map our supply chain. Uh, they take a look at the finished product and they say for cotton or polyester products, there's this entire supply chain and embedded within that supply chain, we've got hotspots. It's the technical term is hotspots. Uh, any place um, along the supply chain where there's a, a deep amount of impact, whether that be environmental or social impact. You know, their goal was to help us understand uh, where are the most important areas is to put our attention, our limited uh, amount of resources and focus, where do we track and measure and where do we um, strive to make improvement? And this, this slide that, that's sharing with all the different hotspots through the apparel supply chain, you can see, first of all, it starts in field, uh, raw materials and cotton growing or polyester or, or rayon is actually made from wood pulp. Um, but all of those raw materials then rolling up through the different manufacturing steps. Uh, and this is actually pretty important because these, these hotspots turn into metrics that we use to gauge our overall sustainability performance that is then shared with retail customers like Walmart. And we have discussions around what is Wrangler's sustainability performance, how well are we doing to minimize our impacts throughout the entire supply chain. So this is a, a very active conversation going on uh, between retailers and, um, and brands. And we need this conversation. You know, when we think broadly about how well are we doing, uh, there's a lot of examples within the textile manufacturing community that, that aren't great. Any guess on how many textile manufacturers in Bangladesh uh, treat their wastewater appropriately, accordingly? I heard a zero right there. <laughs> okay, zero, there's another zero. It's a little higher than zero, but um, 25%. 
So there's about 400 textile mills in Bangladesh and about 25% of them are treating their wastewater effluent uh, correctly. The rest of them are discharging into the local environment, right? And they're dumping indigo blue water uh, into the, the local waterways. And this is, a, this is a, a real pain point for our industry. It's something that we work hard to clean up. It's something that when we work with our suppliers, we give specific instruction on um, on how they're supposed to treat the wastewater, uh, what's important to us, the criteria that we're asking them to fulfill, how can they reduce their water intensity? Um, so, and then earlier this year too, it wasn't just a wastewater issue, but in Mumbai, India, there was a dye stuff factory, an indigo dye stuff factory that had a wastewater issue that actually, uh, it stained six dogs blue, these, these homeless dogs that were running around the streets. And so this, uh, this picture made its way through the media. And so now our, our textile, the textile industry uh, in this general General geography was not only negatively affecting wastewater, but it was kind of an animal, animal cruelty issue as well. So uh, not good uh, proof points uh, for our industry. These are pain points. These are things that we need to address. And when we started working with the Wrangler leadership and started to define what is this thing that sustainability, what does this mean to us? What, what, what does it look like? Um, you know, there was a lot of statements of personal ownership. You know, the brand president for Wrangler said that, you know, just generally we feel like we take care of things. That's, that's sort of what we our charge is that we want to take care of the people that we that work here, the, the you know our, our customers and the people who buy our product, the communities in which we operate. But we want to take care of the people, the communities, the land, and the future, um, and the future and the industry kind of merging together. So this is really how we built our platform. Sometimes internally we don't actually talk about it as sustainability as much as it is the values that kind of guide our company. And so with that, we've been really focused on our own water footprint uh, with our manufacturing facilities. Uh, so Wrangler primarily produces in Mexico now. We moved to Mexico in 1994 for the cut and sew, the year that NAFTA was enacted, right? So we were largely a US manufacturer for a significant amount of time. And then uh, the economic challenges of trade uh, required us to, to move to Mexico for our cut and sew. Um, um, but we still have fabric mills in the United States in our supply chain. And because we're, we're closely positioned in the Western Hemisphere, which is kind of unique in itself, um, about two, uh, well, more than 50% of the cotton that goes into our product comes from, from U.S. cotton farms. Um, we, uh, we, we do purchase a significant amount of U.S. cotton every year. I think it's about 2% of the annual volume, depending upon where that volume falls on any given year. But our commitment to, to managing water has been really around reusing and recycling that water in the washdown phases. So if you think of about a, a pair of denim jeans, the, the deeper, darker blue it is, that's the least processed, right? That's a fully constructed pair of jeans. It's, it's bright blue. The lighter the shade, the more times that, that that pair of jeans has gone through a wash machine and has been abraded, uh, has been uh, treated uh, to get all that, what we, what we like to call character, all that sort of you know, stylistic quality to it. Um, but you can imagine one pair of jeans might be washed a dozen times over to achieve a desired look. So the lighter your shade, the more water went into getting that shade there. Um, so what we've done is we have created a, a, a state-of-the-art water recycling system. Um, it's called a sequential batch reactor. And the water goes through it. And at the end, there's this disk filter that cleans in an additional stage. And we repipe the water into the rinse phases of the wash cycle. Um, and we've been committed to that uh, for more than 15 years. When we launched this, uh, this communication in, in um, uh, last year, um, we had... Uh, we had reported that we saved 3 billion liters uh, over 10 years, and we set a new forward-facing goal of 5.5 uh, billion liters for 2020. Um, so this is our commitment and our demonstration of being a, a good um, water quality steward in our manufacturing environment. Another thing we've done uh, to, uh, to, uh, to bring our commitment to life, to, to, to demonstrate our commitment to taking care of the industry, is implementing this laser sanding technology. So it used to be a hand operator that would sand denim to create some of the, the visual characteristics. Um, but we've been implementing a, a laser technology uh, as a replacement for that. So you can imagine any time you sand something very much like that blue uh, hue on the, on the bell, uh, on blue bell, uh, it releases all of this particulate in a, in a manufacturing environment. So it's hand sanding has always been a, a, a point of concern um, in a place where there's a lot of fugitive uh, particulate. And this laser process really removes that from the equation and allows the um, 
allows it to, to have less operators in that room and put them in somewhere else in the factory and allow for the for the machine to do it. So it's far more efficient and um, it's kind of a, a new wave of technology in denim manufacturing. So thinking broadly, there's a there's a community of folks out there um, that have some deep concerns. Um, we call them stakeholders. You know, they can, you know, they could be in a nonprofit group. Um, they could be, uh, they could be our employees. They could be communities in which we operate. And earlier this year, there was a campaign that was launched by a, a nonprofit group called Some of Us um, and Stand Earth in combination. And they called out the denim brands uh, for polluting uh, the air in Asia. And so. It's true, the air in Asia is, is terribly polluted. Um, I think we saw that in the Beijing Olympics. Uh, and they launched a campaign specifically calling out denim brands for polluting the air in Asia and contributing to 4,400 deaths annually in the Asia subcontinent. So um, the, the issue is real. Um, it's a little bit of a, a legacy issue. There's been a lot of work and effort done to mitigate that issue, but it doesn't stop uh, a community of stakeholders from voicing these, these vo being very vocal, whether it's true and accurate or, or not, or whether denim is specifically responsible for all of the uh, 4,400 deaths, uh, is kind of a stretch in my opinion. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't stop groups from, from articulating that point of view. And what we see is there's stakeholders that have a lot to say all up and down that supply chain. So that hotspot map analysis that I shared, there's a stakeholder group, a nonprofit or, or an entity that has a really strong and powerful point of view about any one of those given hotspots. And it's something that we face a lot. It's something that we, we have to be cognizant of. And as we want to articulate being a good corporate citizen and you know, for uh, being a global brand and our vision of, of taking care of the land and taking care of people, uh, this is something that, that kind of pains us. Again, it's something that we have to address and, and be aware of. Um, and we have to be aware of our, our energy footprint. Like I, I can tell you right now, now exactly how much coal sits, coal, coal fired power plants in manufacturing sector sit in the Wrangler supply chain. And that's something that we can work to mitigate and to reduce. And I share that because um, it's very relevant. Well, so uh, let's bring it closer to home uh, with the stakeholder critique. Um, there's also an organization called Mighty Earth, um, another one of these stakeholder groups that has a lot of concern uh, about uh, the Mississippi River Delta and the nutrient runoff, and they're attacking Tyson Foods right now. Um, they're talking about the correlation between uh, the the ag, uh, the row crops, and all the corn and the feed that goes into the the meat market, and the correlation that that has with nutrient runoff and nutrient loading into waterways um, going down the Mississippi River Delta. And they published this report, Mystery Meat Two, right? So this is a this is a technique. This is a this is a way that these stakeholders express themselves with expose reports and sometimes it's it's not all wrong I think WWF's report on um, the plow print um, it, it talks about grasslands grasslands scattered throughout the United States and sort of the reduction of the grassland footprint and what that means to our natural ecosystems and to the ranching community and I think there's some really valid and, and important stuff that comes out of reports like this and some some ways we can think of these stakeholders being sort of early you know canaries in the coal mine bringing our awareness to issues that, that need to be addressed. Um, and so we think that there's an opportunity to do that with a focus on, on healthy soils. And so we've been, over the past 18 months, really been uh, exploring this idea and, and learning from uh, in environments like this from, from growers such as yourselves, from, from NRCS, from the Soil Health Institute, um, from a wide variety of folks that uh, have a lot of knowledge in this space. How can we articulate that there are um, that there are cotton growers in our supply chain that are attempting to reduce their, their overall impact. And you know, this is just the narrative that we share with the consumers and the stakeholders. And it's, it's, we all have different priorities, whether it be maintaining legacy of, of, of family and farm. Um, profitability, obviously, is, is the number one tenant of sustainability. Um, but I was speaking to someone from, from WWF about different opportunities around soil health practices in cotton growing and their response was they were they were shocked that there was that there were u.s growers that were doing things to minimize their impact in the farming community uh, 
I was like, what, are you kidding me? What, are you living under a rock? Like the soil, you know, soil health renaissance, right? You know, there was a, there was a big uh, disconnect in their level of knowledge and understanding of what was going on and sort of what I saw as an opportunity to communicate on. So we really get excited about soil, healthy soils practices and we've, we've worked to kind of define that um, as we move forward. Wrangler's been a partner with uh, FFA, uh, Future Farmers America, for 50 years. And we host an annual soil health conference in Greensboro for, uh, for the students, both high school and college, to explore this further and, and, and give them some early insight into what we're learning on, on healthy soils practices. Um, so we're pretty excited about it. We're launching the next one on April 7th. Um, this will be our second annual conference uh, on soil health for FFA. But it's one way that we can kind of continue the dialogue and continue to promote some of these important practices. And when we talk about soil health broadly, um, you know, I think there was six practices that came top of mind to us, and maybe not all of these for, for every geography. Um, you know, we heard a little bit about uh, the challenges with cover in, in certain semi-arid regions this morning. Um, but I think for us, the, these six practices really define the types of things that we want to see in our supply chain that address the hotspots that are embodied in the cotton that ends up in our product. So, you know, conservation tillage, no tillage practices, obviously cover crops, um, the use of a, a rotation and maybe preferably a complex rotation, three different crops in the same space over five years would, would be preferable, at least that's what the science says. Um, you know, some sort of variable rate application or soil grid mapping uh, would be preferable. Um, some sort of water efficiency measure and, and IPM when appropriate. So, should we try this video? <laughs> Okay, but can we, U.S. cotton is, is best in class. The amount of technology and innovation that's come on farm has been unprecedented. And there is a, an opportunity uh, for a grower to tell their story. It's time. U.S. farmers are leaders worldwide in investment, in best practices, in coming forward to participate in leading opportunities. And the field print calculator is a management tool. It's based on farm level inputs. And it's a great opportunity right now for cotton farmers to continue to be the best at what they do. The field print calculator allows farmers not only to measure the improvements they make, but also to share that with cotton's customers and get the respect that they deserve for their sustainability practices and their stewardship on farm. Our customers are expecting more and more every day. They want to know not only where that t-shirt has been made, but they want to know where that cotton is coming from. And that pressure is only increasing every day. You, you can't improve what you don't measure. The more data that a farmer would have, the better he'd be able to decide how much water do I need? Where do I need to apply a fertilizer? It is important for U.S. farmers to continually make improvements. When you look at all the inputs that the farmers can put into this tool, it helps them determine how can they maximize their yield. Then ultimately that means maximizing their profit. We believe at Guild End that the U.S. farmers are doing the right things. The field print calculator would help us to tell that story. We have great confidence in the American grower, but I think that we can never be too content with where we're at. We need to continue to strive. And in order to continue to improve at the pace in which we are all expecting to improve, working with the field print calculator is gonna be critical. So kind of a rough intro there, or just meaning I didn't have a, a lot of time <laughs> to, to, to give it an intro, proper intro, but um, what we're attempting to, to, to share there, and you can see the, the alliance of brands that are working um, to sort of promote and tell, tell a, a more positive story around the supply chain, is the, the need to track and measure via a field print calculator or via some sort of looking at the metrics and, and some of the even some of the early data that we saw this morning uh, to allow that to inform on-farm practices and choices to minimize impact. And field print calculators is one way to get there, one way to do that. So that was a, a little bit of a rally cry to get engaged with the field print calculator. And I know the, the TAWC is, is, uh, use, utilizes that tool quite, quite frequently. Um, 
Yeah. You want to try the other video? Okay. This, uh, this presentation is starting to skip around a little bit, but I appreciate your patience. Uh, so let me give this uh, intro before you start that video. Um, so the Wrangler is, is owned by a, a larger uh, company called VF Corporation, um, purchased by VF, Wrangler was purchased by VF in, in 1984. But, uh, and there's a several other brands, we call them sister brands like Timberland and the North Face in the portfolio. And VF Corporate was asking, how, we want to communicate around the potential for healthy soil practices around carbon reduction, right? Because we have this, this community of stakeholders and, and peers and, and consumers that are concerned with global issues. They're concerned about changing climate relating to, to, uh, to carbon. And uh, you know, regardless of where anyone's opinion on that is, is, is that there's an opportunity here to do some positive storytelling and connectivity on, on how is it that agricultural practices can positively affect um, the global issue around on climate and, and this kind of got exciting they were they were challenging us to to build the message less around soil health around carbon to address that stakeholder concern and this video shows that that's what we were trying to do um, we were trying to demonstrate our way to articulate the way that that healthy soils practices can have a positive impact on on climate change and so um, let's try it see if it works oh yeah great change, what we're looking at is how do we use our scale and our influence to really help reduce our carbon footprint across our whole entire value chain and create better practices to actually help the earth sequester the carbon that it naturally does. I do think of soil as this frontier. What we know about soil today, it's just the tip of the iceberg. As we've engaged on our cotton pilot and started to work with farmers, we're learning from them. They're teaching us in ways that we weren't aware of. We start no-tilling, which means we don't work up the ground. We plant into whatever's growing there, the previous crop. In the past, we would have plowed this field to create a seed bed in order to plant crop in. What tillage does, it's like a tornado hitting a house. If the soil is a living ecosystem and organisms live there, tillage is like blowing up the house, it's destroying the structure, and it's giving them no place to live. After we harvest a cotton crop, we actually plant a wheat cover crop behind the cotton just during the winter months to keep something green and growing, to keep weed pressure down, to prevent soil erosion. In the summer months, as the wheat dies, it actually provides a mulch, so therefore we're conserving moisture. Just the single practice of cover crops, that practice alone can be used as a, as a carbon sink. We're an advocate for these sustainable practices. Healthy soils is the primary focus. Farmers that are growing cotton under a healthy soils protocol and these principles, that's making Wrangler denim sustainable. Cool. So you can kind of see how we were trying to, to create the connectivity between healthy soils practices and, and addressing global issues. If you've ever taken the time to go on the, the, the NASA map that shows the, the carbon concentrations in our atmosphere, it's fascinating. It's dynamic. It's like a weather pattern. It, it, it morphs over the calendar year. And it shows that there's big concentrations of, of uh, greenhouse gases in the winter months and then as ag kicks in and the life cycle of all the living plants um, happens, it just, it diminishes. It's a really powerful sort of visual, but you can see what we're trying to th do there by, by telling a grower story to address this larger global issue. And it gets me excited too, because it kind of really flips the conversation in a meaningful way. Like what's the opportunity for, for agricultural producers to, to really take a leadership role and, and have a huge and, and pivotal impact with something as big as climate, right? So to, um, to kind of put this into a little bit of a trajectory, like we recognize that on, on this journey, on our soil journey, that there's, there's, there's challenges that we face. We've got soil loss every year. If, if, if nothing else, weather is an extreme challenge, but water scarcity, obviously in this region and the focus of the TAWC in the conference, uh, and then some sort of lack of definition of, of what sustainable cotton is. You know, I think that there's a, there's a wide variety of definitions out there, and I think that um, they all have different meaning in terms of what those actual impacts so how can we, we talk uh, about sustainable cotton with a defined um, set of, of, of not just tracking and measurement, but ultimately benefits and value that comes back to the environment? 
uh, and the opportunities you know, to create different frameworks and partners to, to, to create this change we want to see, the precision technology, the focus on, on healthy soils. You know, a lot of our peers are, are focused globally. I think because where we are in the geography of the US, it makes, it makes this growing community really important to us. Like this is, this is our home. So the outcomes is that we really uh, have some, uh, we were able to improve the, the cotton practice that we're, or the Wrangler's able to be a part of the story. Thank you for, for having us be a part of that story. And we're able to see those, that productivity around the metrics and the changes, um, and we're able to move the dial. So our first project um, pilot that we launched last year was with the Newby family in, um, in Alabama, in Athens, Alabama. Um, we were introduced to them uh, by, by the E3 platform and, and Brent Crossland from E3 uh, as doing a lot of incredible healthy stewardship practices in Alabama. They're very close to one of our textile mills and, and provide fiber to, to one of our denim mills. And we felt that it would be um, really worthwhile to spend time with them, learn from them, and, and again, articulate and tell their story. And we spent about a week in the field. And um, what came out of that was, was similar to, to, to Jeff's intro this morning. Um, that it, it's really about the legacy of family. And so we put together this, this story about the newbie family around healthy soils and, and what it means to them and, and their family and their legacy. So we thought we'd share this one too. Every farm in this county is generally a family farm. Two brothers, daddy and children. Uh, it's, just, it's just part of life. You've got to have somebody you can cover for you. You've got to have somebody to help you. There's a certain good pride feeling about your children wanting to follow you in the profession you're in. Cotton has always been a part of our family farm, and it probably always will be. I feel like Wrangler coming in and purchasing the cotton from a grower is putting a face with cotton, a farming face where people can see where their fiber comes from. Many people don't understand. Some people have never even seen cotton, you know, growing in a field. And I think it's gonna be a great thing for Wrangler and for the American cotton grower to be able to market their product. If we don't tell our story, nobody will, and Wrangler's helping us tell our story of how we farm as a family and how we make a living and want to pass it on to the next generation. Great, so a really sweet little video that came out of our week there with them. Um, in Athens, Alabama. Um, so just to, just to close, you know, I think that uh, this is early for us uh, as, as a brand, as Wrangler, is talking about the, the material inputs. Uh, it sounds so technical of our product. Um, you know, give us some feedback. Uh, I'll be here all day. I'm, I'm very interested to hear what, what you have to say about um, the way we're articulating it, the way we've created our platform, and uh, are we on point? Are we missing something? Is there, um, you know, please do let me know. But uh, I, I'm very uh, hopeful and aspirational that, that this larger cotton growing community than members of the TAWC uh, can have a really meaningful impact and tell a really powerful story to consumers so that we don't end up being, uh, you know, uh, and not this would ever happen, but so that the, 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 the challenges with Bangladesh or the challenges with the Mighty Earth campaign or those things that we see in the marketplace that get people riled up and excited and, and concerned about our industry, we have such the, the, an opportunity to tell a much different narrative around that. And it really gets me um, excited to think about the potential of, uh, of, of, of what that story could be. So thanks for having us and um, quick time for a question. Got a minute and 15. Uh, so how, how brands like you are going to tackle that issue? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's a big challenge. And I think I only have a partial answer. So um, just, to, just to mean that um, when we, if we look 10 years ago, about consumer purchasing patterns, you know, I, I think it would be hard to point and say that 
that sustainable products were preferred amongst the consumer market segment. Like it, it, it wasn't as clear or relevant. Um, then it became, it, then fast forwarding maybe the five years ago, and this is all just rough, but because uh, we do spend a lot of time looking at consumer insights and, uh, and time to, to evaluate what are the purchasing decisions that drive consumers. Five years ago, it would be if you put two products in front of you and they are equal on fit, form, function, and price, but then there's a sustainability attribute associated with this one over the other, that then they would choose, more likely they would choose the one with the sustainability attribute embedded in the product. But now I think we're in, in a different time. I think that there's there's a different consumer expectation and you, uh, you hear a little bit about that. I think, um, was it Chris Fox from Haynes mentioned that it's becoming increasingly, uh, the, the need for transparent transparency with consumers is increasing. And I think that um, it's almost as if it's fast forwarded to this place where it's an expectation that that sustainability attribute is embedded within the product that you aren't going to produce, that these aren't extra added values that go into product, but these are considerations and these are requirements that if take Volkswagen with the emissions cheating scandal, for example, if you watch their stock price directly after that, and this is, this is correlative and, and reasonable, but it completely plummeted. I mean, we can see that, that reputation and the risk of a brand's reputation when, when it's highlighted that they aren't living up to that good corporate citizen um, requirement that a consumer expects, that it ends up becoming um, disastrous or it can be, it can be a no-go. It can be an immediate non-starter for that consumer on the purchasing decision. So as it applies to cost, um, generally there's not a lot of appetite to charge more or to be able to pass costs on through. It's a cost that we, we have to absorb um, and it's not easy. I think the way we do that is we couple sustainability with innovation, technology, and sort of efficiency and advancements. So many of the projects that I work on in sustainability proper, like the water recycling, for example, yes, there's a, a, a CapEx investment up front, but over time that ROI pays for itself and that sustainability and innovation combined uh, can, can find a way of, of hopefully writing the cost situation. So that's why I said I only have a partial answer. I don't know if it's, uh, it's entirely clear where that burden of cost comes, but anytime we can find a, a sustainable solution that saves on cost, that's, uh, that's an immediate want, win, and that's something that we gravitate to. And if it doesn't save on cost, maybe we have to engineer it again so that we can find a way that it does. Yeah, great. I'm kind of out of time, but I'll, I'll, I'll catch up with you after. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, I will say this. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that, uh, you know, the commodities supply chain is a really nameless and faceless uh, kind of, uh, you know, structure that doesn't allow itself well to, to host this conversation. Absolutely. Agreed. Um, and I think that that's something like, what, what is the economic model of the future? What does the supply chain uh, of the future look like to, to help support both the, the sustainability advancement and the economic profitability of the grower and sort of a, a healthy COGS margin, cost of goods margin for, for an apparel manufacturer. I think that's, uh, that is what we gotta get to. That's what we gotta work to. So um, I totally agree with you.